Ava Davin. Uh, she's the broker and principal at Portside Real Estate Group, uh, founded in 2012, um, and has sold uh, 310 million annually and about uh, 100 properties in 2018, making them in the top five uh, real estate groups in the state. Um, to her, next to her is Sue Quilty, uh, who's the VP of Loans and Operations at Residential Mortgage Services. Um, she's been working there since 2014. She has a 20-year career in um, consulting on regulations, compliance, and um, quality control and operations support for financial services. And last but not least, we have Michael Sosnowski, um, who's the owner and broker of Maine Home Connection, uh, which is a boutique real estate um, service in Portland area, um, and he's owned that for five years uh, previously with Remax and Keller Williams. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, so I thought I'd just start out talking about where we are right now in residential real estate um, and what trends you guys are seeing out there, especially with people like myself who are you know, uh, in the millennial age group, about uh, 23 to 38. And, and I'm interested if there are any big differences that you see in how they approach buying a home and financing a home compared to people who might be a little bit older. So who's gonna start? <laughs> we already, we already, we already agreed we were going to start, and we we're going to go this way, and then suddenly you're jumping to me. <laughs> Just, but I'm going to let Sure, I can first. start. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Peter, for inviting me to be here in the Portland Press Herald. This is awesome. What a great, large crowd. That was super dramatic. <laughs> um, That's so, why I wanted you to go first. <laughs> so millennials. So nationally, the data shows that millennials are going to be 45% of all buyers in 2019. So almost half. I don't know. Maine doesn't have great data, so I'm not sure exactly what that translates to Maine. We have you know, an aging population, so I don't think it's that, um, that robust in Maine. But millennials these days, and I think probably, frankly, all consumers, um, they're changing how they want to inter interact and, and have and you know conduct services. They don't really want to type an email and wait hours or days for someone to respond or leave a voicemail. Like they don't even leave voicemail um, and wait for someone to respond. They want to take out their phone, push a button, and have something happen. So when you look at how residential real estate has been conducted for decades, it's been it's been the same. And so um, I think they're looking for a change. Um, and I think that. Um, the venture capitalists are seeing that need, and so um, it's pushing some technology into our industry. You know, it's, it's interesting. I had a conversation uh, with a few of our main loan officers yesterday because I spend a lot of time with product development and technology development to service, you know, the buyer. And um, we are talking about different age groups in Maine and and you kind of think, well, millennials will embrace the technology and want less human contact, potentially. That's what you know. You kind of think of first versus um, maybe the generation that hasn't grown up with, with uh, you know, technology. But it really isn't how it plays out day to day. And Andrew, one of our loan officers, is here today. But we, they kind of see the same pattern that technology is not going to replace the need to have a trusted partner in that transaction, which is a good thing. It, one of the loan officers in our Auburn office, she said um, she, what she fears is that it's gonna be something that happens that nobody really wanted. You know, like we won't be able to avoid going down that path of less human contact, kind of like pulling back on tellers in a bank and that kind of thing, like no one really likes it, but I guess I don't have much of a choice. So there's no real um, variation in age group with millennials versus, you know, the, any other borrower that's coming through our doors. Um, and it's in, um, as far as the whole argument that millennials don't want to buy houses, that they're, you know, they're not taking that leap. I think we're seeing a shift in that, um, where the behavior it, it's starting to pick up a little, and they are buying houses. Um, and they just need kind of what you were saying earlier, a little bit more help navigating through what situation fits them the best. They know they're making the right decision. So they take it a little slower. 
You may find this a little surprising, but I am not a millennial. <laughs> I admit it. But I've been selling stuff a long time, real estate just being one of those things. And one of the things that I firmly believe in is that service is what it's all about, except how we do service is so different these days. And as an example of that, <clears throat> a lot of real estate agents here in the room, all across the country, are always faced with how do I reach out to people? How do I make contact with them? And back in the day, we used to actually send mail. Then we went to email. Then we went to phone calls. And now we're at text messages. Now we're at um, Facebook chat. But the fact is, it's about making a connection and having something of value to talk about when you finally do make a connection. I know that for those of, uh, of you who are real estate agents in the room, I mean, there's all kinds of theories about if you get an online lead, call them you know, 10 times, 10 days in a row, um, never stop hassling them. But the fact is, you're doing that, and the person in selling insurance is doing that, and the person selling, uh, if do one search uh, for a new car, next thing you know, you're seeing them all over the place, all over your uh, websites that you're looking at. So the, the, the consumer is bombarded by relentless advertising. So how do, you, how do you go and stand out? It's all about the message you want to send. And one of the things we found recently is like text messaging really works. Text messaging with adding a video to it really works, providing that you're providing some sort of answer to the question they may have, even though they might not know what the question is yet. So is that a millennial issue? No. I think it's more just a consumer issue in how you're reaching out to those consumers. And that, yes, we can do all kinds of analysis that says millennials like don't want to communicate or they only want to communicate this way or that way. But think of how you communicate yourselves these days with people trying to reach out to sell you stuff. It's the same thing for them as it is. I would even argue and say that people who are more mature or adult or whatever, older in age, who have more assets, have more people trying to sell them stuff. So, so they're getting bombarded by it even more. So it's the question of trying to tailor that message specifically to what those needs might be. And it's selling 101, except we're on a, in a new, a new digital age. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's just kind of like from the grassroots of how it's working. But of the difference with the millennials is the need for instant information. They're used to being able to get things very quickly. So I think that's um, having that data available, we're seeing a lot of innovation in that versus having to text someone to get it. You know, they want to be able to, to get it themselves. And to, and to see, you know, millennials, you know, all the data shows they really rely on online and peer reviews. You go to buy a pair of shoes and you're looking, you know, for those comments from other people that bought them. So um, I think the same goes with um, their influences in, in real estate transactions. I, 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 I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and what I, what I find is uh, we look at a lot of analytics about how people search for properties, like on our own website, for example. And... Uh, anyone who knows our company knows that we really invested a lot in search. Okay, will we ever be to Zillow of search? No, of course not. But we try to take it at a very local level. And what I find is that people start, and whether they're millennials or just anyone, but specifically millennials in this case, is they look at things at a very global view. And they look at that global view on a mobile device maybe while they're in the car, while they're on TV, while they're doing something, okay? And then what happens is they move from the global to the more specific, okay? And as you get more specific, it's way harder to do that level of investigation on a mobile device, okay? You need to be able to actually, even though people say millennials don't read, I think they do. And what they do, though, is now they want to look at a community, Okay, and they want to look at how could I see my life in my community? How, what's my commute? Where do I walk my dog? How many um, 
parking spaces are there around my office. Those things have a higher value level, and you're not going to find those things through a app that suddenly will give you some uh, demographics that are just general. They want to know specifically, so they might read a blog post about it. They might look at something you've prepared specifically on you know, Munjoy Hill and get into the deep parts of it. And that's where I think what happens is you start this global search on mobile and then you work your way towards, you know, desktop searching, stuff like that. And you can see the progression of how people look at things if you have analytics that show that kind of stuff. And it's just, I think, a way of um, tracking how people think a little bit and then providing answers for what they're looking for. I kind of want to get back to something that Sue said, which I found really interesting. And you were, I think you, you mentioned that the fear is that people won't have an option, that with this new technology coming down the line, that's what's going to be available, and you're not going to have something else. Um, and just to, just to kind of come on that, I mean, is there, are there things now, are there, are there, is there tech now that you're using that you wouldn't have um, you know, two or three years ago uh, that you're using now all the time that either makes your your life and your job easier, or your job especially, or, or makes it more challenging? Well, I can speak to it from just a lender's standpoint, and because we all see it, um, any, any bank or lender, of course, used automated underwriting five years ago. But um, we've had to adapt that technology and kind of follow the regulatory and the kind of credit avail credit access changes and be able to um, adapt to any needs in changing that technology for different product reasons. Um, you know, we all know that in, in our country, I guess, which is a good thing, whenever anything bad happens to a consumer and their ability to rent or own a home, you know what hits the fan. And what we see from it is just total consumer protection, and that's what happened, you know, 2008, 2009. The bottom dropped out, everybody freaked out, and we had a huge flood of new regulations, which I'll talk about a little bit more if anybody wants to get really bored later. <laughs> I can talk about. But, um, you know, what you have to do as a lender is the technology and the automated stuff, you can't... It's there, and you can easily be wooed by it and be like, oh, I can do this loan. And you kind of, it's, it's like you have to use technology safely. So, um, you know, if you're doing business the right way, you, you use that technology a little bit differently than you did five years ago, which is the opposite direction, because you have to have more of a human, you know, like, yeah, it's approved, but this just doesn't make sense or whatever. The other piece that... Um, on the technology use is, of course, all the mobile app and ability to automate the, you know, access to credit, mm. you know, um, and that you see, like, we, we were looking, we, we use Simple Nexus, and we've used that for, we used a, a different product prior to that, but we kind of had to upgrade to keep up with what we wanted to provide as a lender, and um, I was looking last night at the different adoption rates because we do business in kind of down the eastern seaboard. And Maine is right up, you know, kind of operating right like the other states. It's not less adoption or anything, which I thought was kind of interesting. So it just speaks to the ease of it, you know. So that's technology that we've used a lot, kind of new in the last five years. Yeah. This, this is kind of like a, a statement and a question. And it's about mortgage, which isn't really my field. But uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who's in mortgage services. And I asked them, was the online uh, applications for mortgages doing anything to your business? Were you suffering as a result of that? And um, the answer was very much what you just said, which um, surprised me a little bit because I thought the answer was going to be, oh, my God, we're, we saw a 20% reduction in uh, – applications. But the fact is, is the online companies are using the same programs and software that our local bankers are using as well. And it goes through the same process of the same companies doing the same verifications. Um, 
and then a per then there's actually a human involved that comes in and communicates with people. And so it all comes then down to how big is your budget for running ads at a national level versus just trying to do business um, at the local level using those same tools. And I think I had a question for you in there, but I'm not exactly sure. Well, I have a comment anyway. I'll find the question because I have a comment on it. Um, it's interesting because all, all we're seeing is just smoke and mirrors with this stuff. You know, you get like, oh, we're going to close in six days. We're going to do this, do that. And um, it's, it, you're right. It all boils down to the same product. We all are operating pretty much in the same regulatory framework and the same credit availability framework. Um, how you market the technology like millennials are, are smart, and I don't think they get wooed by that. They're always kind of like, mm, I don't think so, you know, and they question some of the stuff that's out there. There's simply, there isn't enough oversight in advertising in this space to protect the consumer adequately. So you have to, you know, everyone in this room, you, you know this very well. If you're not partnered with people that are doing business the right way, you're, you're just not going to be successful. So you could easily go down that path of, oh my God, I'm going to close in eight days, you know, and it, it hardly ever works out that way. It's just, it's bait, you know, not bait and switch that strong, but, you know, you get them in the door and then you flip but, them. But the fact is, if you have a client that's got strong credit and yep. uh, you're, you're going you're gonna to be able to get that approval and close that credit as fast as, any, as anyone yes. who is advertising nationally on TV. Yep. Exactly. And there were some, you know, I don't know if you want me to blab right now about some of the obstacles in Maine with that, but should we continue on the Obstacles question? about, sorry, obstacles in terms of, <laughs> hmm? obstacles in terms of. Well, you know, some of the, some of the availability of these products nationwide, they'll, they'll move faster in other pockets than they will here, you know, um, and one of the things that we see that's coming, becoming more prominent our property inspection waivers, for instance. So if, if it's a, a, collab, a, a property that um, we can use valuation database on, and or Fannie or Freddie can when they're doing the automated underwriting, if they can use the valuation models, they can just say, oh, you know what, we're comfortable, just like any Zillow's estimate or whatever, we're comfortable with this property value. You don't have to get an appraisal. That's going to happen less in Maine because we don't have enough accurate, reliable data yet. Um, so some of the some of the new technology, the new product enhancements, or whatever, um, might move a little slower. It's going to take some time for that to catch up here. Yeah, that's that's actually what I've heard um, for a lot of kind of what we're, what we're also going to talk about, like the i buying platforms and things yeah. like that. They're really not well suited for markets like Maine because the housing stock is all over the place and there's not enough, it's so small, there's not enough data. Um, so yeah, yeah, definitely. Was there anything that, that you've really like caught on in terms of tech that's, that's either made your life great or made it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> made it really I, challenging? I mean, it's interesting. Our, my company's been in existence for six years, so <laughs> things have changed drama dramatically as far as the technology that we've added as far as transaction management um, commission management, um, all of our back office, even our marketing software. So there's been a lot of changes and a lot of vendors out there that are offering products to um, real estate companies that really make our life a whole lot easier on the back end of the transaction. Okay. Um, we kind of opened the door to this, and so we can we can dive right in. But the big Kind of some of the big headlines are all about these the new prop tech and how much venture capital is getting thrown at it. Like, went from hundreds of millions to billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars over five years. Um, and like, maybe you guys can just talk about what some of these platforms are and whether or not you think they're legitimate um, and it, how much staying power you actually think is, is going to go in this in this bubble. I can start on that question. I mean, it's, it's really exciting, um, I think. So let's put it in perspective. Annually, $100 billion of real estate commissions are generated each year in the United States. $100 billion. So the venture capital companies see this and they want to take a bite out of that. And that's why they're coming up with idea after idea. In 2017, there was $12.7 billion of VC money invested in this. We don't have the data for 18 yet. So it's a lot of money. 
to try to figure out, can we take some technology and take these commissions away from the realtors, you know? And so realtors have been making five or six percent, uh, you know, on these transactions for years. And um, the VC company, they're trying to see if they can shift that. And I think we'll probably all agree on this panel that it's, you're never going to take the human out of it. You know, Zillow isn't going to come visit your house to determine that estimate. And as Peter mentioned, in a market like Maine, where the values are going to change from house to house on the same street, we're not in Indiana where it's track housing. And sure, um, an automated valuation model can determine a house when every single house is built the same year, exactly the same. One has a fireplace, more than one doesn't, and they can determine that data. Um, here, it's, it's really tricky um, to do that. So I, I, you know, I think we're protected in that sense. But I do think once they figure out, you know, once these startups find that thing that's going to change it, it's going to happen so fast. I mean, think of Uber. We used to like call up taxis and like wait on the street and wave them down. And, and now you just press a button and they show up. And, um, you know, look at Amazon, how we used to shop and how that's different. And so there is something that out there that's going to click. And when it does, it's just going to be like wildfire and it's going to change the industry. It's not going to change um, the need for humans and the need for professionals, but it'll, it'll change how we do things. Why do you think it took longer to get to the real estate industry than it did uh, transportation or flights because or something like that? It's really expensive. You know? <laughs> I mean, we're selling really expensive products. We're not, you know selling things that can, you know, be easily transacted. There's a lot of legalities and there's a lot of, you know, different things going on, um, you know, with a transaction that, you know, that require, you know, human talent to navigate through that. For people who don't know, can maybe somebody describe what some of these platforms are? Because they make it, they make it seem like selling or buying a home can be as easy as, as getting an Uber or a Lyft or, you know, ordering off a... Uh, some food or something like that. It's, right. it's really I, I can incredible. I can address that. <clears throat> Is I th I think most people are probably aware of these companies, but um, a venture capitalist type company would be one known as Open Door. Another one would be Knock. Uh, another one would be Offer Pads. And these are companies, as we were just saying, that were created uh, by venture capitalists, people with cash from Wall Street, to buy a home and then resell a home. And this has been going on by companies for a long time. Um, I think the one I heard the most recent was uh, uh, webuyuglyhomes.com. And I, and I read the other day that, that that company was operating in 45 states and had like 900 franchise offices, which like, I, cu I couldn't believe it. Um, that was a company that you would see with a sign hanging on a... Uh, light post or a telephone pole with a phone number, okay? So, but, but yeah, exactly. But, those, but that's, those are companies that were never, that was a company that was never in any way, shape, or form capitalized like these current companies are. And that's a big difference. And there was no such thing as a way to uh, get an offer online sight unseen. But the, at the end of the day, though, these companies still have to make money. They have to buy a home at a price where they can go and make whatever investments they need to it and sell it and make money and cover the cost of their capital to do so. Okay, so that's been going on for a long time. Open door and knock need to do the same thing. So we'll put those in one category. And then you would have a company like Zillow who started out, you know, whatever it is, a decade ago as a media company designed to promote uh, agent listings and then sell advertising to those same agents. And so over the course of that decade, they became a, a billion dollar company. I mean, yeah, like I think their revenue last year was 1.2 billion. And I think in the last 10 years, they, they never made a profit uh, of any kind, okay? but. They, but they see that they have competition now, and that competition is from these other capitalized companies to buy and sell homes. So their goal has to be, how can we participate in that market? And that's where they started. It's called, what is it, uh, offer or something? In, instant offers, okay. And then the third group is the large franchise companies. You have Rayology, uh, Keller Williams, Remax, 
who are saying that they're going to put together a similar program so those, their agents can offer that to their customers as well. So now we have three big segments of competition, but at the end of the day, there has to be a, a financial reason to do these things. You have to be able to make money buying homes and selling homes, and the cost of that is huge. And so how big will it become? That's what everybody's question is, and I think there's a lot of opinions out there. There's a lot of hype, that's for sure. You read any article anywhere, I buying is the next big thing. But the fact is, and I keep coming back to it, you have to be able to make money at it. And as, as a homeowner, okay, why would you sell to one of these organizations? Well, because you have to. You have a contingency contract on something else. Um, you've just gone through some personal you know, tragedy of some sort, but you have to say, okay, I'm willing to do that and forego some of the, some of my valuation. And if you're willing to do that, then it makes sense. I, I read a little thing the other day and it was talking about the size of the market. Okay. The biggest company doing this right now is off, um, Open Door and their biggest market is Phoenix, Arizona. David, just like you were saying, <laughs> every house is basically the same. So putting together a valuation in a place like that really works. So what, what would you think their market share after doing this for like five, six years in Phoenix, Arizona is? Yeah, <laughs> it's not even 5%. Yeah, it's, it's, it's anemic, okay? And then Zillow, who is in that market too because they're following it so closely, their, their market share was less than 1%. And the interesting thing is in the last year, they bought like 700 homes and only sold 150 of them. <laughs> and that's in one market. That's a lot of inventory to be carrying. So am I sitting here saying, oh my God, this will never work? Eh, I'm not really saying that. But when you look at the numbers and how it plays out, you have to really scratch your head and say, how does that work? But I think for us as practitioners in the industry, we have to be totally aware of what this is and figure out alternatives so when we deal with our clients, we can be the person of knowledge to say, okay, this is what you bought your house for, this is what you put down on it, this is what the current valuation is. If you absolutely need to sell, maybe this is a road to go, okay? And maybe my company can help you and maybe it can't or maybe I need to work with someone else. But it's about, I think, educating consumers on this phenomenon. And whether, if, if we have a down market, a lot of these companies will probably disappear. But right now, we're, we're not saying, well, thank, hopefully, we're not saying, we're saying that we're not in a down market, but we still have to deal with that situation. Do you have to add to that, yeah, please? Yeah, I agree with, with everything that Michael just said. But what's curious is the amount of money. I mean, venture capitalists are brilliant. I mean, they research this, and they, they look for opportunity, and hence, they make a lot of money. Um, so the amount of money that's being invested, and as Michael said, Realogy, the parent company for Sotheby's, Coldwell Banker, Better Homes and Gardens, they have already their own instant offer um, platform. The same with Keller Williams. So like everyone's sort of following suit in something that, in our opinion, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense nationally. Um, so it's, it's just curious to see that if, is this money going to discover something else? with all of these engineers figuring out this technology, are they gonna land on mm -hmm. it? And that's gonna be the thing. And that's sort of what, what, what I think. I don't, but I mind, um, it, it's not gonna replace real estate agents. I mean, if you're gonna, um, I mean, there's an art to a deal, right? If you take a property, you wanna maximize the profit for your client, you know, is there an opportunity to split the lot or do something creative with owner financing or a possession prior or after closing? I mean, a bot isn't gonna be able to, to handle those nuances um, in those negotiations. So we're not, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna change um, the job that we need to do as realtors. I think it's gonna elevate us um, because the, the agents that are acting like robots and not really able to do those things are just gonna go away. I mean, there's not a lot of barriers of entry um, to become a real estate agent and the larger companies um, just hire, you know, people without a lot of vetting. And so I think those, you know, we might, that might shake out a little bit because people would rather just go online and have a bot do it than have someone that isn't bringing that kind of value mm -hmm. that a true professional can. Does that make sense? You know, another example of uh, 
investment in the industry is not an eye buying, but is in a, is a company called Compass, which you may or may not have heard of. They are a hugely venture capitalized real estate firm uh, started by some people, I think, probably from Silicon Valley or had a history of doing something else. They had over a billion dollars in cash to spend, and they went out and purchased large, high-end profile uh, real estate companies all around the country in Beverly Hills and Miami and New York City and where, where Los Angeles, wherever, okay? And in that scenario, they're not eye-buying. They are running a, uh, I would say, a standard real estate practice where agents uh, go out, get listings, buy homes, sell homes, charge commissions, and they're betting their ranch on the fact that they're going to develop um, artificial intelligence that takes what you were talking about in the back office and brings it up to yet another level to help assist their agents become better practitioners in the art of real estate. But the fact is they have a enormous investment to try to recoup running a traditional real estate business. Have, have That's, they made any money? I don't think they're profitable. And pro I, was, I was in LA last week and my brother lives in Santa Monica and there was two Compass offices in Santa Monica, which is not a big town. Compass signs literally everywhere. I, 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 it's, it, it's, it's, it's going to be, that's going to be very interesting to see what happens with that type of venture capital money. I mean, I, I read something where they recently opened up like a tech office with like a hundred uh, engineers yeah, they, to do right software. I mean, they're banking, really. <laughs> they're banking on that they'll find the technology that can mm -hmm. find those buying habits and, and give that to their agents. So, but it's, they haven't developed it yet. But an interesting side of that too, though, is that there is a lot of tech in data right now. And it relates to not only to real estate, but to finance, to all different types of things where um, they, it's the focus is on predictive analytics, okay? It's to determine what you're going to do next, even though you might not know that you're going to do that yet, based on your behaviors <laughs> and based on what can be tracked that you do. There's probably 200 to 300 sources of data that you don't even know you're involved in where you're giving information to these companies. But the fact is, it's now getting scalable where companies like even... Like, like we, we companies in Maine can afford to buy these analytics and then start to become more clever and more uh, insightful in terms of how we market to potential clients. I think that's the kind of thing that's a huge win that will begin to separate out companies going forward, agents going forward, who can understand the data and then actually do something with it to market to the people we were talking about at the very beginning of this conversation. Those are incredibly uh, exciting uh, um, uh, opportunities for, for all of us in this industry, I think. I'm, I'm glad you could explain Compass because I spent about half hour on their website when I was writing the story for this, and uh, it was so jargony and buzzwordy, and I couldn't figure out what they did. You know, so, that, 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 I'm, that I'm, is, really, I'm really glad that they are just that, a pretty, that, the, that, pretty that's a, that's, typical real estate firm because that's what it seemed like. That, that's such a good um, point because I, 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 I followed them for a while. when Before they were Compass, they were known as uh, Urban Compass, okay? And then they changed their name to be more you know, cool, I guess it was, and as they expanded. And I went to their website many times to say, man, there's got to be something here I can learn, okay? And, <laughs> and, and I, I did learn some cool jargon, I will admit. They have, they have very, very well-produced videos. I think that's mostly yes, what they, they do. Yes, they do. Uh, I mean, when you're spending, you know, 5000 on a video versus, you know, a couple hundred, it does, it does help. But their, 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 their search tools even aren't that great. I think you, you mentioned smoke and mirrors before, and I'm not here to bash Compass, but I just did. And, um, <laughs> and I think there's something to that smoke and mirrors with those guys. If, if I can just ask, so you mentioned, I think, uh, was it Open Door, you said, in, in Phoenix, you know, yes. after five or six years, has 4% has of the market? Correct. I mean, that actually seems pretty big to me. Um, for, for a real estate firm that doesn't have an office, that doesn't have agents, um, that, that seems like a pretty substantial slice for somebody who's just starting up and is buying homes online. 
I guess you could look at it that way. <laughs> I mean, does that... Am, am, I, am I totally I, off base? I, 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 don't know, I, I don't know of any other real estate firm I, I, that would like come in right. sight unseen and be able I, to... I'd probably put it this way. You'd have to measure that market share with the amount of vest investment you made to get that share and say, is this making sense to me? Sure. That, that would be the, the proof. Sure. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't sound like you guys are, are worried about your jobs in the face of all these you know, billions and billions of dollars getting thrown into, into new apps. And, and I think you mentioned, you know, sure, the real estate market is riding really high right now, but when and if there is a downturn, they'll go away. I mean, what makes them more vulnerable than, than you folks? Probably just due to the amount of investment they have makes you more vulnerable, I would think, is just the pure economics of the situation. I mean, at some point, you have to make money. Just the kind of... I the other side of that, though, in a down market, the iBuyers might be more attractive to people that are struggling mm -hmm. um, to sell it the traditional way. And you can just go online and get an offer and be done, take the hit and move on. So... You know, there might be an opportunity for that. I think investors, you know, big retail giants, institutional investors right now that can't find foreclosures, they can't find inventory to buy, mm -hmm. you know, they, they are a large percent of those, that 4%, those are the buyers in Phoenix that are buying those properties because they're just going online and gobbling them up um, so they can have inventory for rentals because... We're talking about the future of home buying. I mean, the future of renting is only increasing in America as the prices have gone up and people can't afford it, especially in cities. Right now, there are more adult, non-related adults sharing homes than ever before in history in the United States. So that means roommates, housemates. And so there's a ton of technology going into that, too, to match people up and to have um, a safe situation for roommates. I mean, historically, you would go on the paper, go on Craigslist, and you might get like a psycho um, to share your home with. But now um, the sites, you know, it's kind of like Uber. Everyone's like fully vetted. And then the, the roommate's only responsible for their share. So your roommate could leave, but you only your lease is only for the part that you're sharing. So um, people are able to live in a more luxury apartment in cities than they could normally afford because of these models mm -hmm. matching people up and getting them into these places. Um, so I think, you know, in Europe we see more, there's less homeowners, but they're bigger, they own multiple properties, and a lot of people rent, and I think that's also a shift um, that we're seeing in, in the urban areas where things just become out of reach. I mean, look at San Francisco, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's virtually impossible to buy a home, so. Um, in, in terms of trends, I mean, looking, looking to the future, what, how do you see preferences changing for um, you know, for how mortgages are structured or for what kinds of properties people want to live in, what amenities they're interested in. Um, what, what do you see happening there? And where, where do you think, do you think it's going to change substantially again in, you know, another five or ten years? Do you want to start with mortgage? I would love to start with mortgage. You probably don't want me to start with mortgage, but I want <laughs> if, if, if there's no mortgage, there's no house purchase. So yeah, that's right. Um, well, we're seeing, you know, similar to what I said before with technology, you have to adapt to whatever, you know, the product or the regulatory framework is because it, we get pulled in the direction. You know, a lot of times for lenders, we're forced, you know, because we're regulated very, very heavily. Don't mess with where someone lives or you're in big, big trouble kind of thing. Um, and what we're seeing right now is with volume down, and inventory, you know, some different pockets struggling, we're seeing a real shift to um, alternate types of loan products. So we're, we're kind of slipping a little bit back. We're losing some ground on, you know, the protection of the ability to repay and qualified mortgage thing, which was a huge result. It was a result of everyone losing their homes, you know, in, in 2008, 2009. There were strict, very strict lending standards that everybody has to follow, or else you don't get protection as a lender if that person defaults, basically. And everyone freaked out. Nobody wanted to do any type of non-QM lending, which is just a, a riskier loan product. doesn't mean dirtbag stuff. It just means a little bit riskier. Well, we're seeing um, trends where 
you know, I was at a conference, speaking at a conference a couple, probably last month, and so many investors are out there trying to push these products again, you know, um, not having to verify an income stream, for instance, and just using deposits on bank statements. Well, who's going to go that way? Somebody who can't afford the deal, you know, kind of thing. Um, not having to get uh, self-employed tax returns for somebody whose credit score is a certain level. And we just, you know, at RMS, we were discussing adding an investor that had products like those, and we decided that we didn't want to do it because some of it's just, it's the same stuff that happened in Lee. You know, you, got, you have to, like I said, you kind of have to understand what you're getting into. Um, not all of it's bad, some of it's awesome. But I'm, I see a trend with products. Um, regulators are really nervous about it. They're starting to kind of like, uh-oh, what's happening? You know, what's out there? And, um, you know, so people are pushing stuff now, and some of it is like, mm, yeah. So that's, and I think that's going to, you know, it's funny because what we'll see is, as what you mentioned, David, with the investment properties, um, we see an uptick in financing for investment properties because um, people might be holding on to them, you know, because they know the rental market's really good. They can cover their mortgage and still gain equity in the property. So some of those guidelines we'll see shift to meet that demand. Where's the demand for those riskier products coming from? I mean, is it people who can't get traditional mortgages? or what? Yeah, people that can't get traditional mortgages, um, people that um, might have had a bankruptcy that was, you know, something that just doesn't fit perfectly into the credit profile for, you know, it's all about fitting into this box of ATRQM, it's called, and it's just the standard mortgage you know, if, if it gets approved by automated underwriting, basically, that's awesome, do the deal. You know, it's loans that are not approved by the automated underwriting system for different reasons, and they just need to take a path. It doesn't mean, some people call it QM light because they're trying to pretend that they don't do non-QM loans, but they're not all bad. Um, but you see, you know, and you have to, well, some of these profiles are perfectly fine. They're good, solid buyers, they're, they're not going to default in their payment. You just have to be very cautious as a lender what you want to get into. Like RMS never did any subprime stuff, which um, was awesome. I'm so th I wasn't involved with the company then, but they certainly had the foresight not to do it, which is a good thing. And I think we're kind of creeping back into that risky thing again, you know, as you're trying to generate more yeah. business. No, that sounds... The, the that same sounds with, with selling. That sounds really worrying, especially when the, when the real estate market is so yeah. high right now. So you're giving these risky loans yeah. for properties that are really maybe overpriced. Um, and it's kind of, we have conversations all the time, like, okay, let's get back to, you know, serving the community and making sure that we're not creating a problem that's going to, you know, surface at some point later on. I think mm -hmm. a lot of conferences, regulators are talking about this, investors are talking about it, people that set the underwriting guidelines are talking about it. It's all the buzz now. Mm -hmm. Did I answer the question? Or did I confuse the question? No, no, I, I, I think you yeah. answered it. Um, how about you guys in terms of in terms of properties and, and what people are, are looking for? Um, I'll, I'll comment on that real quick. Sure. Is um, one of the things, actually, I'll back up a second here. Uh, as I was driving in this morning, I had I just happened to turn on the radio, and I actually listened to the radio, too, um, talking about old school. Um, and there was a discussion going on about Maine uh, adding a carbon tax. And I don't know how far along this was or where it stands in the legislature, but it was, it was 40 cents a gallon on uh, gasoline and propane and uh, heating oil, that type of stuff, with the purpose being to reduce Maine's carbon footprint. Okay, we were going to be the leaders in this area. But the, the, the transition here is to trends that we see in the market, and one of them definitely is in homes, especially new constructed homes that are more energy efficient. Um, homes that have 
uh, solar solar power. Solar power is very affordable these days. You, you can even have neighborhoods that can join together to cr create a solar array. Um, how the house is constructed, what type of insulation is used, windows. There are more questions, uh, comments, interest, and those kind of things that I think that, that we, there's probably more in the last year interest in that than I saw in the last 10 years combined. And I think if there's a takeaway for me in terms of just trends in general, that's, that's a very significant one that, that affects how we're going to build new homes, how the density of properties will be in a neighborhood, and what's going to happen to fossil fuels and things like that as they become more expensive and how do those things balance. That a, a decade ago was probably just an idle conversation and now is becoming not a, not a reality yet, but we're on the avenue to becoming, we're getting ready to take the next exit onto that type of uh, home construction. Back quickly on what Michael said, it, there's cities in California now where any new construction is required to have a solar component. So that is definitely happening. And I just add one more thing for trends, definitely smart home technology <laughs> in the next, you know, in the next 10 years is totally gonna change um, what's added to new construction. Um, I guess I also, I also meant in terms of where you're seeing the, the biggest demand, like what kind of house size, what kind of house design you're seeing the biggest demand in right now and, and whether you think that that's going to continue or it'll switch back to something. To something that, that, that's a kind of a funny thing because anybody who's been in this business a while has listened to customers say, oh my God, I got to downsize, and they go from 4,000 square feet to 3,200. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's like the classic. Isn't that, isn't that so true? Um, but I, smaller is okay, providing you do the component that you were just talking about, the, the, smart, the smart component. Um, but I also think that just look at what's happening in the city of Portland. We're becoming more dense in terms of how people live, and I think that's a good thing, and it all goes along with trying to reduce commute times, improve the quality of life. I think this is, this is something we can learn from millennials for sure, is that the quality of your life is really more important than you may have given it credit to before, and how you live and how you work and how you're connected to your community is more important than it ever has been before and will probably continue to be so. So things like like walkability, things like being you know not not having not having a two car garage, not having a swimming pool. Like is that? I don't know. I kind of yeah. like a two car garage <laughs> myself, but the trends, so do I. You know, everything you read, the trends for millennials, their value experiences versus possessions. So I do think you know in the next little bit of time we will see smaller, more efficient homes in locations that they can access. What Michael was talking about that full live work play. Got it. Um, you know, just if you can look into your crystal ball, um, in, in five years, do you think, how, how do you think your jobs will change? How do you think buying a home is going to be different than it is today? <laughs> five years, I don't think it's going to change at all. You don't think it's going to change at all? Not in Maine, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I. I, I want to say, oh my God, it's going to be so much different because I'm an enlightened person and I can see the future. <laughs> but the fact is, I agree with you, Deb. I, I, we're still going to be doing the same things, except I think we're going to be doing them smarter. And we're going to have access to more information. Like even, even a small company like ours has uh, you know, a, a software platform that gives us information about our clients that we never really had before, or we had it and it was on a spreadsheet, and now agent walks into the office, pops up, says, call this person, this is their birthday, they just, their kid just got an anniversary, stuff like that. I mean, that, that's good stuff. It helps us to be smarter in terms of how our marketing works. And I think those types of tools will become more and more useful and valuable over the next five years. And not everyone will adapt to it. There'll be the curmudgeons who just refuse to accept that. And 
the, the mix of people who are successful will change. And as you adapt to those technologies, I can see those continuing to change and improve and, and make, maybe we won't have to work 60 hours a week. Definitely, I think the back end is definitely improving for us with technology. I mean, just think of the back end for a second. It wasn't that long ago where at the end of the year you had a file, you know, the size of this. For every property transactions, they went into a box and went into a vault and never was seen again. And now they're all, everything's up in the cloud and you may have like three documents you keep in a draw somewhere just in case. I mean, yeah, it's just, I mean, and that, and that, and you, yeah. and you think about that, that, that transition happened in a matter of what, two years? I mean, it just happened instantly. Next thing, if you were still doing it the old way, man, you were old school. Okay, my five years is um, nationwide. We will see much more use with the property inspection waiver and less, less full appraisals. So we'll rely much more on database to determine if that collateral, you know, what, what, the, what the consumer needs to spend to get that property value. Hopefully that will catch up in Maine. We will see um, a lot more automated access to income and asset documentation. Right now in Maine, it's not, it's not um, really being used yet because there were so many employers that maybe might not use the company that, you know, you can, the lender, basically the borrower sits with a loan officer. They don't exchange any documentation. They just, you know, yeah, we can pull your credit. Okay. You know, what's your, who's your employer? And they access the lender, you know, contracts with a company that just goes out and grabs the employment data and grabs the asset data from their depository institution. So everything comes directly to the lender, eliminating any potential fraud, which is awesome, and makes it a lot more streamlined for the consumer. Um, we, have a way, we have some ways to go in Maine, certainly, because not everybody is you know, ready in that, but it's taking off in some urban cities. So you basically could have instant, yeah, where you could close you. The regulation trid, you can't close less than seven days, but it would basically you know, really clean that up. You could have a lot shorter contracts for sale. Interest rates would be lower for borrowers because the lock is less shorter, so it's cheaper to have a short lock. Um, so we'll see that happening. Uh, the technology, the mobile app and all that use, what's happening is it's, it's creating partnership communities on, you know, like you're, a, a realtor will have, a, you know, access to that mobile app with a particular loan officer. So you're seeing, which is a, a good thing, but potentially could create some regulatory focus. So I think we're, we're moving down this path of automating all this stuff, but they're gonna, they're gonna, the regulators are going to plop stuff in our way consistently over the next five years. Data protection, yeah, we'll have a lot of you know, predictive and analytics but sooner or later, all these data breaches are going to cause people to pull back on that stuff. So I see this not continuing to go, blah, 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 you know, because something's going to, that consumer is going to be harmed some way, just like, you know, the credit, the credit report breaches. So I think it will be choppy at best. Um, the one danger with all of this technology creating these uh, relationships online between all the business partners is regulators don't like that because if a realtor and an appraiser, an attorney, whatever, take away the consumer's choice on where they shop, you know, that, that's what I think we might, we might have some obstacles just in the industry, politically, if, if, we, if we see a change, you know, in the political forefront. I have to have a question for Sue. Um, looking at the, the mortgage process, you mentioned that the appraisals are mm -hmm. starting to be eliminated because of mm -hmm. the data. Um, what about the surveying, you know, the mortgage inspection plan where they still have the guy going out and like measuring the lot? Is there going to be better data with that and that can also be eliminated? I would think there would have to be. I mean, there's few states that require that to happen. So it's more like the, the risk on the title end of it, you know, and you see all that automation happening um, with getting access, you know, for title searches and all that. So I would say that definitely will start to develop over the next five years as well, yeah. Um, well, thank you for joining us. I'm sure you wouldn't mind hanging around if anybody has any questions they didn't get to. Uh, but join me giving a hand for the panelists.
Thanks so much. We'll see you at the next one.